Another session with us at Academy, but there's four of us in the room. Um, and I'm echoing for some reason. Very frustrating. Um, I am Dr. Chloe Farahar. I am in the bottom left, I think, for people. Um, I'm a white person with a shaved head and giant glasses, and I have been ordering these hoodies like oh, like anything, anybody's business. I'm wearing a grey hoodie with a dinosaur on it. But this hoodie goes past my knees. It's amazing. Mm. And it's by a company just called, I think they're just called Huge Hoods. And it's so soft and so comfy. And I'm already trying to talk to them to be like, you need to market these for us as autistic people because they're so comfy and really good value. So like, they are not paying me. <laughs> they're just really comfy and yeah, fantastic. Anyway, I'm joined today by um, a new co-host, which is Sof, who is on my right, I think. Is that the right for everybody? Hopefully. Sof, if you wouldn't mind doing a description. Oh, yeah. I'm Sof. Use they, him pronouns. I have dirty blonde hair, shaved sides, and longer on the top. I have big red and gold glasses. I'm white. And I have a gray tank on, and you can see the top of my body braid on as well. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> nice. Um, and Sai has made a joke in the comment section already that I'm four foot six, by the way. I am not four foot six, <laughs> and that is why this hoodie is giant. I am five foot eight, six or seven. Thank so they're just normal me. hoodies for everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is their medium size. Like they've got three sizes, and the bigger one is just ridiculous. It's like a giant blanket. It's amazing. Um, so Sof and I are joined today by they both have been hosts as well, but today they are a guest. So we've got Kieran, who's above me. And then Katie. So, Kieran, would you mind doing a description? Sure. Yeah, I'm a uh, mid forties, um, white, slightly overweight man with uh, 
slightly balding hair, gray hair, what I've got left of it. And uh, I wear glasses and I'm currently wearing a dark blue, navy blue t-shirt with an orange collar. And your panda in the background. And my panda, which is always in the background. <laughs> Just and, watching. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Katie, who's in the top right. Yeah. Um, so I'm Katie Monday. I go by they, them pronouns. Um, I'm a white person who has similar hair to soft, actually. Um, I've got kind of short back and sides, a little bit messy on the top, kind of blonde hair. I've got large glasses. We've all, we're all wearing glasses today. Um okay which kind of ombre from kind of dark brown on the top to orange on the bottom. I've got an eyebrow piercing in my left eyebrow, which is kind of uh, like a kind of toxic color, like toxic <laughs> yellow and blue, which kind of match my very 90s uh, rubber little um, earrings as well that I've got in each ear. Um, and I'm white, if I haven't said that already. I'm wearing a white T-shirt, boring, and I'm sitting in front of Simon's lovely green hideous curtains in my front room <laughs> fab um so, so i gets very excited about the green curtains i don't know why um but so i does also get excited about the mayonnaise salad cream debate so you know who knows with Cy. um <laughs> so today we are discussing autistic masking and talking a bit more about a term that katie has coined recently which is shielding um and i'm quite excited about this because i feel we've already had little discussion before we come on and I do this all the time and I'm like then we have to repeat what we just said um, but I think it's really exciting because I think it helps all of us um, move even further away from the non-autistic idea of camouflaging and we're going to talk about this so um, I, I'm, I'm quite excited by that idea and I think um, it's fair to say all of us are otherwise we wouldn't be here having this discussion um, so yeah Katie and Kieran are going to educate a little bit about this um, I'm not going to do too much about who people are and their dedicated interests because we've had all three people um, other than myself as well uh, on before but Kieran very briefly if you like in a sentence who are you what do you do who am I oh my god um, in a sentence, can I do that? Um, that's my time up already. Um, so you panic me when you ask me this question. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, I am a writer, consultant, researcher, speaker, trainer, do, do a bit of everything really. Um, um, but my real kind of passion and focus is autistic identity and autistic masking and the intersection of all that because I think masking sits right at the heart of the whole autism narrative. Oh, I'm going to make a note about that. Why? Okay. And Katie, uh, your sort of sentence of who are you, what do you do, what you're interested in? Um, oh, who am I? Um, I? I run social groups for disabled young people and I coach wheelchair basketball. I've been doing that for the last seven years or so now, uh, which is how I actually found out that I was autistic as well, because um, I'm around a lot of autistic children and just think, hey, we're quite similar to each other in a lot of ways. Um, and I'm currently doing a master's in research about um, trans and or non-binary autistic experiences. And um, we're doing like a kind of narrative work on that and about how we should be making recommendations for future um, research on our experiences. And I, I'm actually applying for my PhD at the moment, which will hopefully be in something similar, I would have thought so. So, yeah. So personal and professional and academic and just my whole life entirely at the moment. I think, yeah, if, if um, anything in relation to autistic experience becomes your dedicated interest, that, that's what we end up doing, um, which for good or bad. <laughs> um, so can I just ask, we're going to ask the 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 key question but I know that Kieran also has whole talks on this so I don't know how we can boil it right down but very briefly if possible what is masking what is autistic masking who are you asking Chloe sorry Kieran you asking me <laughs> <laughs> um in a sentence uh it's a psychological and ended up being physiological response to stigma and trauma. Very much it in a very, very, very small nutshell. And also a human behaviour as well. It's not just restricted to autistic people. Hmm. And then 
if I correct me if I heard this wrong. So why does masking sit at the heart of autism? Is that what I understood that you said? Yeah, that's what I said. So okay. um, I think it's from from our perspective, from autistic people's perspective, um, we experience stigma and trauma on a daily basis. Um, prejudice, marginalization, being othered, all of those kind of things on a daily basis, literally for a lot of us from the moment we're born, and the invalidation of our sensory experiences, the invalidation of our communication, our behavior, our development, how we move, everything. Um, we're invalidated on, not always deliberately, but it happens. Um, so to we're going to discuss the, the use of the, the name masking today, but for want of a better word at the moment, to mask becomes a natural response to that invalidation because it's all about safety and self-protection and how your brain and body responds to that stigma and trauma and over the developmental kind of period. And that's something that is innate in all autistic people because, like I said, it's a human behavior. This is a response to humans being marginalized and other marginalized groups have very similar terms for the same processes, although it might look different within autistic people or the mechanism might be different within autistic people. The outcome and the causes are generally very, very similar. Um, so, yeah, so that's why I think it sits at the heart of it for autistic people, but also it sits at the heart of the autism narrative because, as we're going to discuss today, Gender has now become a massive part of the autism narrative, and it always was because of, you know, the, the, it's a sexist narrative, and it always has been. Um, that's a massive part of it. The intersection of autistic people within um, race and disability, gender again, you know, it, it just sits at the heart of everything, including the way that um, autistic people who are deemed severe or whatever horrible term people want to use for describing people who are non-speaking or physically disabled in some way, um, the dismissal of their ability to do that is related to the whole incompetence thing as well. So it, it just sits at everything. It's the intersection of all the different narratives around autistic people and also our experience, I think. Anyone else is welcome to keep jumping in, by the way. So, mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I'm just thinking as well, because I know that you've obviously spoken about this issue where people make the assumption, well, an autistic person who also has a learning disability can't mask, because like you say, that implies some level of sneaky intelligence that people Choice. must have yeah. to be able to mask. Um, and I know Rachel Cullen has talked about this too, that because they work in a, a care home, from what I understand, with autistic people, some with a learning disability and so on, um, and they explain they do because they are being watched 24-7. Um, so that idea that it must be a conscious... So can we all talk about that then, this idea that it's a conscious decision to mask? Um, any thoughts? I know Kieran will, but this idea that it's a conscious decision because of I will always now discuss and it is from learning from you Kieran that you know we are likely to start masking our autistic nature from birth or from at least very very small child babies potentially um, whereas I feel that when I was learning about masking, it was probably through the narrative of non-autistic ideas around camouflaging. And I, I, I felt I had the impression that it, it was something you did in, say, teenage years, right? Because it implies that that level, like you say, of co conscious decision making. Um, and so that was really important to learn that, no, it is, like you say, it's very unconscious. It's a survival mechanism and it can start from when you're you're a child, a very small baby, or um, whereas the camouf... Can we talk about actually the camouflaging narrative then, maybe? The issue we take with the, the non-autistic idea of camouflaging. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, where to start, really? Um, I don't know. It's just it's just based on toxic neurotypicality, the idea that, you know, there's a neurotype and there's a way of behaving and being and thinking that is the ideal and is the centre of, you know, this of revolving universe. Um, and that we actually want to be anything like them. 
like I don't like to have the things that I struggle with in life, which is quite a few things, uh, but I wouldn't ever want to be neurotypical. Um, and I think it, again, it, it centres what what would be considered neuronormative people and what their ideas are on how we want to present ourselves in the world, um, as opposed to it being like, you know, like Kieran was saying about, you know, microaggressive kind of stuff that we all hear on a daily basis. Like, you don't look autistic. My cousin's auntie first removed whatever is autistic and he's not anything like you. Well, you know, we're all different people. Um, or, you know, my favourite. Oh, but you do a degree. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. I do. And, you know, I also hoover. <laughs> <laughs> and know how to use rudimentary tools um so yeah it's, i think that's my main issue with it and then it kind of being um attached to the kind of idea of the female phenotype of autism which couldn't be in any stronger like whatever they are quotation marks um because it's just another way of other othering people who aren't cis males but who are also autistic um, and almost kind of blaming um, people who are assigned female at birth for not not showing ourselves fully. And there's kind of like a sneaky, misogynistic kind of um, un underlying thing there that I find really, really difficult to say that, oh, well, girls get missed all the time because they're really good at camouflaging. They're really good at fitting in. Uh, which just screams to me that society doesn't care about girls and our behaviours and how quite a lot of the time that's actually really self-destructive behaviours and inner kind of uh, monologues we have about ourselves and stuff. So it's all based on how our behaviours affect, like what I like to call the normies, you know, and I think that's why camouflage is such a big issue for me because it's written by neurotypical people to say, oh, these group of people are weird, but they want to not be weird, so they're going to act not weird. And that's, yeah, that's not massively problematic. But I, because I think in pictures as well, when I hear camouflage, I, I do imagine people consciously putting on war paint, mm -hmm. getting those weird outfits Ooh. that make them look like a hedge or a bush, <laughs> and sneaking in with all the other bushes or something i don't know it, it it just sounds like say too conscious um and it sounds aggressive as well like if you put it in a context that is you know based around war or conflict and stuff it just sounds like not only why are we sneaking around um you know to not be seen or, or whatever it is people are imagining that we're doing it also sounds really yeah it sounds really like you say about war and stuff it sounds very aggressive which is also not something that, um, yeah, that needs to be stereotyped about us, really, especially around kind of challenging behaviours and stuff like that. Or now I think they call it behaviours that challenge, um, as if that's any different. Um, so, yeah, I think that, yeah, it's not very helpful. Mm. And I wonder with Soph, unless, Kieran, you wanted to jump in. Um, no, so that's, I mean, there's so much there to unpick from what, Katie said, but if Sophie, there, if you want to jump in there and there is, and I'm going. We're obviously going to come back to things like you know discussing the the blame um, of <clears> particularly, <throat> like say, people yeah. who are assigned female at birth because um, of Kieran and Amy Pearson's very important paper that I make people read um, about the you know blaming us basically. Hmm. But I'm interested to hear from Soph because your discovery is also relatively recent, hmm. um, and I wonder. What were you lucky enough to avoid the discussions by non-autistic people about camouflaging? And did you see the stuff on masking by autistic community? Or so 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 I guess what I'm asking is what what do you know? Where where did you come at it? Did you find it in camouflaging literature or discussions or mm, uh for people who don't know me, I was diagnosed last August and the process was very affirming and the people around me who encouraged me, uh, they're autistic and they use language that's supportive for them. So camouflaging is actually a new term for me and I'm lucky that I never had to experience it. And I'm, but that also means I'm kind of like 
oh, what's so what's so bad about it? And so I, I appreciate these answers. And my first thought was kind of like, with with military or or hunting or like, there is some truth to that of wanting to hide yourself to survive and get through and that the stakes can be really high. So that's like one facet that I appreciate about that former term. Uh, and I'm, I'd be interested in why why masking feels better or shielding or any of the words that fit for you. Kieran, why do we hate the term camouflaging? <laughs> it's not um, even the term, is it? It's it's the narrative that went with the term. It is the narrative that went with the term, and it, it's you're right with the kind of the whole. It doesn't even bring to mind for me. You know, you maybe people might think of things like chameleons and stuff like that about blending in, um, but knowing where that term has come from and knowing the the narrative behind the researchers that have decided to use this terminology and where that's come from it is very much what you're saying it's it does bring to mind those kind of military connotations and the word that i've written down there is infiltration that there is very much a narrative here of this is a group of people who we are uncomfortable with who we are examining as research subjects who are trying to infiltrate society who are trying to hide themselves among us and there is very much a kind of a narrative behind it of that and another aspect of this as well is that the the, the group of researchers that this has come from are very much have come down the line of baron cohen and frith and those researchers who have thought quite negatively about this for a very long time and have spoken quite negatively about this and pathologized us in lots of ways, even down to the fact that the, the camouflaging narrative is broken down into three subsections. And autism researchers who have come down the line of Uther Thrift love breaking things down into three subsections. Um, we've come from our triad of impairments and there are other splits into three in other ways, but this is the camouflaging narrative at the moment is broken down into assimilation, compensation, and masking. Um, and assimilation is what they describe as us copying non-autistic people. Um, compensation is about us wanting to be neurotypical, making up for our lack of neurotypical skills and compensating and hiding the fact that we don't have those skills and so we make them up and we try and fit in whatever way that we have and then we have masking which is about suppression and really that's the only bit that they've vaguely got right i feel um so and they've missed out a whole lot of thing and when when you when you go through and you read the research the whole tra word trauma is never mentioned once in any of the research papers and it has started to be uh, to be used and that's really only since mine and amy's paper came out that, that all of a sudden people started jumping on that bandwagon um but it's very much framed around kind of the whole thing is about they think autistic people want to be like non-autistic people and that word want is really important, that choice. And if you ask the average autistic person off the street, actually, when you dig down into it, they just want to be accepted for who they are. They don't want to be like somebody else. And they don't, this, this grass is greener on the other side thing doesn't really work unless you're talking about people who are really, really struggling and who think that other people's life is better if I could just be like them. Now, that's not necessarily wanting to be like someone. That's feeling like you. that's the only choice available to you is to be as much like other people as possible, where this whole illusion of choice really, really comes in, that there isn't actually really a choice there at all. That if you're not like that or you don't project yourself in some acceptable way, then, of course, you're going to be penalised and punished for who you are. And that's 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 not a choice there. So that's really why I have such a huge issue with that, the whole narrative and the use of that phrase as well, because we're not trying to infiltrate. We're just trying to stop being treated as badly as we are. And that's a very, very different thing. Does that help a little bit as well, Soft? Like, so I'm, I'm kind of envious that you didn't have to get sucked into... Mm. You know, part, you know, the discovery and your discovery journey didn't mean you had to learn about how we've been thought of in terms of camouflaging um, and things like that. So I guess for you, how did masking, has masking impacted you? Because there's this thing. So I'm coming back to why does masking sit at the heart of autism? So I guess what I'm asking, I'm going to come back to soft, but it, is it the case that you would say all autistic people mask to some extent? Because there might be some autistic people say, well, I don't mask. I'm just myself all the time. Do you feel that's not possible, potentially, Kieran? Um, 
yeah, I don't think that's possible at all. I don't think that there is anybody out there that is 100% themselves 100% of the time because, you know, we know from context switching that everybody changes and modulates and moderates their behavior to some extent. So those behavior changes do occur in, in all situations. But what really made me think differently about this and what really, when I started first talking about projecting acceptability rather than trying to fit in and trying to do these things is when um, an autistic person, I had a long conversation with them and they talked about that. They said, I don't mask. I've never masked. And then they started describing their childhood and growing up. And they were talking about the fact that if they weren't obviously autistic, they felt like they were going to be punished in some way because people didn't know what to expect from them. So they, the phrase that they used was they took their autism out and they polished it. So they were more autistic, if anything. It was another, it was just another layer of them not being authentic because they were projecting this version of themselves, which was obviously autistic, so that people would be able to identify what was going on. So I think you've got to look at it in a um I think the problem is that people, the way that the mask develops is, and I talk about the mask like, you know, Chloe, I talk about the mask like this, this living, breathing thing that, that, that exists as a kind of secondary personality. And the whole point of it is that it doesn't want you to look at it. It doesn't want you to examine it. It doesn't want you to really, really be reflective of what's going on. Because the moment you look in the mirror and you recognize that that's what it is, it just crumbles it breaks it doesn't work properly because you're it's it's also wanting to kid you as well it's wanting to protect you and keep you away from those kind of thoughts and feelings and all of that kind of stuff so that's part of the problem here and when we look at that research narrative when people are being asked questions firstly you've got that issue that how does the researcher know that the person answering the questions is actually answering authentically or is there an element of of masking in their answers mm -hmm. in terms of fawning and things like that as well you know am i telling them what they want to hear am i projecting acceptability through my answers here or am i really really digging in deep but also there's an element from the research side of it is how are non-autistic people interpreting answers? Mm -hmm. Because if an autistic person says, in X situation, I do Y, that could be interpreted as a choice. Whereas from an autistic perspective, that could be a literal, in X situation, this is what happens. Mm -hmm. With no choice at all. It's just a description of what's occurring in that situation. So there's 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 so many levels to this. And I think... To say, for someone to say, I have never masked and I never will mask and I don't mask, implies that they are in full control of their brain and body 100% of the time in every situation and are perfectly safe in all those situations. And I honestly don't think that's possible. And I just want to flag autistic selves who we've had on before, who um, experiences life uh, with alters as a, um, a system and they're just explaining that they relate to this so much they feel our alters are very linked to masking mm. as well and, and that also would make sense because mm. um, as autistic cells would have discussed in their video with us you know disassociative identity as it's called in the literature but as experiencing themselves as a, a system it's based on trauma yeah. um, why they end up uh, developing alters um, and I wonder, Sof, so obviously we talked a little bit about camouflaging and masking. And do you, how do you understand masking for yourself, for instance? And then I want to ask Katie, because then we might get on to why might we want a little bit of a shift in some respects. So Sof, how do you, if you can, articulate masking for yourself? Yeah, 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 yeah. Before I was diagnosed with autism, I was as being autistic. Medical language. I'm a medical librarian, so like I might use some medical terms sometimes, even though that's like not the best language. Um, but it's just what I have in my head sometimes. But I was diagnosed and in the process of getting diagnosed with lots of different chronic pain conditions, uh, ultimately EDS. Uh, and going into the doctor was like high key masking. It was how do I want to present myself? Do I want to wear makeup? Do I want to look tired? Do I want to be put together? Will they believe that I'm in this much pain if I'm put together? Will they, like, how will it affect my treatment? And so that was a, I've, I've thought about that consciously again before autism was in my head about how do you present yourself to someone else? And then sociologically, it's like, what symbols are you, are you showing someone and how are they going to treat you as a result? And with what kind of stereotypes 
for example, that they might have out about autism, how will they treat you differently and how will that um, negatively affect you? Uh, and for that, an easy image for me is uh, a, a, another oppressed identity would be like just being a black man, being treated like a criminal, and then eventually not having many other options besides perhaps resorting to crime to survive, to make it to the next day. So I can see how someone who's masking is, becomes more autistic in order to be seen as, as worthy and needing those expectations, the, the way that other people treat them, whatever, whatever they're getting from being more autistic, like surviving in the world, like that serves them. So that's how I think about masking a little bit sociologically and a little bit Buddhism as well. Like myself is only myself because of all these other people and our interactions together, the environment I'm in and whether I feel safe or not. So like I have a lot of ideas, but um, masking has worked well for me so far. And so I'm super interested to see like how this this language might be different or might fit better. Um, okay, so can we move on to then, that it does, it moves us on nicely, to why, Katie, you started talking more about shielding. Um, what didn't sit uh, well with you in terms of the term masking maybe or the description of masking yeah i think there's you know i'm like so fun i'm only you know kind of self-realized maybe about four years ago and formally diagnosed about two years ago now um and i think before then i was just the weird kid <laughs> at school i was just the person who made all their clothes and painted and sewed everything on their clothes and you know you weren't supposed to like have all these brands and stuff on your clothes and um I made a coat that had um I think it was an anti-flag quote about like you can't you can kill the protester but you can't kill the protest and it had all different stuff you can imagine it had all different stuff on it and I was just like basically anything that you tell me not to do like fuck you like <laughs> this this is how we go and people aren't supposed to have short hair so I shaved all my hair off in school because the under grade four rule, whatever it was, was only for boys. So bollocks, like it's all coming off. So I think masking for me, I think where I wasn't realized at all as autistic, I was just a strange person from a family that is quite peculiar as well and kind of very um, independent and doing their own thing, uh, you know, within the frameworks that we all work within. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I just don't feel like masking was ever a thing for me. Like I wasn't, I don't know if I wasn't self-aware enough to realize that my behaviors were being perceived as odd. And I just wasn't particularly interested in other people. Like I remember mum saying at my formal diagnosis, because obviously they love to talk to parents, um, about the fact that, you know, that my senior school would say, yeah, Kay doesn't really talk to anyone at lunchtime. Like, they don't hang around with anyone. They don't really have any friends. And and my mum said, well, you know, they go into school. They don't have any problems here as far as I'm aware. They're not being bullied. Like, I don't have any problem getting them into school. So, so for me, I wasn't particularly interested in other people. Um, I kind of vaguely am <laughs> now. Um, but I'm, I'm very much um you take me as I am or you don't take me at all um and I think a lot of people see that as very aggressive um arrogant I've been called all sorts of different things um and I think being perceived as female and being loud and outspoken is like a problem for some people as well um strangely enough especially for other women seems to be seems to be some kind of problem which is strange when we should all be lifting each other up so I it's just another thing for me um and I realize when people talk online about their own specific autistic experience that it is their own specific autistic experience um but when you've it seems like the whole autistic community is um and not just about masking but about loads of different things and I you know my my self checklist for for being typically autistic seems to be getting shorter like by the minute like 
I'm not even typically autistic. I'm just, I, I don't know what I am anymore. <laughs> just confused. That's, that's when I really, really love um, Nick Walker, just, you know, neuroqueering, even being autistic. Like we can be autistic mm. in our own way as well. And mm. that certainly helped a lot of people because otherwise I think, Kieran, would you say as well that we then have the capacity to mask even in the autistic community because mm. we're trying to fulfill a role yeah it's meeting other people's expectations and feeling that 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 social pressure to meet, meet other people's expectations and i think lot i see you see that happen all the time that people aren't necessarily confident or don't have the strength or haven't been enabled with the strength or emancipated enough to kind of to be themselves to be authentic mm. and and feel like they have to agree with other people or feel like they can't challenge certain things or feel like they have to say mm. yes i do this as well even if they don't or don't necessarily mm. to that extent or it's it comes back to kind of a lot of that comes back to fawning and a lot of that comes back to kind of you know for an example if you go to the gp and you feel like you describe oh you feel like you might be depressed so you go to the gp and the gp whips out their kind of 10 questions for you and you answer the questions and they don't maybe feel quite right but it's the only reason that you can think and and then later on a year later you find out about autistic burnout and you realize that actually that criteria that they had didn't quite meet but you agreed to it because it was the nearest possible thing that explained your situation so i think a lot of people fall into that narrative as well of feeling that kind of pressure to just say yes that's me too without the nuance of breaking that down and this feeling and thinking about what that really means for them and that's because i think many of us obviously experience this this invalidation and this gaslighting over the course of our lives and we learn not to listen to ourselves and we learn not to self-evaluate and we learn not to self-crit and break things down and 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 really kind of dig deep into kind of what's going on for us because even if we did express it other people wouldn't have maybe believed us or invalidated us over it so you just learn not to listen to your own brain and body a lot of the time and and then that does then become another another layer to this kind of mask that that you project it's which is why i do think that the the projection of acceptability is a is a more descriptive term for what's really mm -hmm. happening but then you use that and it still sounds like it's a choice and it's how you get away from that sounding like there is any element of choice to all of this which there is to a degree because we all choose to modulate our behaviors in some ways but when we dig down deep into it lots of this is just reactive hmm. Hmm. and i I wonder if some of it is that even with the amount of work, particularly Kieran does, but obviously a number of us are trying to do to try and explain what masking actually is. I wonder if it's still, particularly in schools and things like this, because the amount of times, because I am a woman and I explain, I can talk as a woman myself, but an autistic woman, um, not a woman, woman, an autistic woman, um, the amount of times getting asked can you come and explain masking and girls and i'm like no i can come and explain masking i can explain being an autistic woman from my own perspective but i'm mostly going to come and tell you why that's also a problematic narrative and i wonder is it that people are still grabbing this idea of masking as if it only refers to being quiet so that was my note i've made to myself as if it only refers to being quiet and hidden as opposed to because when Katie was describing all these things where you said you were you know you were loud and you were this that and the other I hope a lot of that was just you being authentic but some of it might have been still Kieran's potentially idea of masking which is presenting a particular person as opposed to trying to fit in per se does that make sense yeah I think that kind of does make sense I think the line there is <clears throat> <clears throat> is the difficulty in understanding whether, because if code switching, masking, camouflaging, whatever you want to call it, is a universal thing, which I believe it to be, then where's the where's the autistic line? You know, um, what makes something autistic masking as opposed to, I'm a teenager, this world is really weird, Um I'm surrounded by people who, and, and there's like sexuality and gender added in and mashed into my story as well, which made things really confusing. Um, you know, in a school that, um, I try not to sound arrogant, um, but, you know, I've always found in whatever 
educational level I'm I'm in, I'm perhaps um, would be better in the one above that, if that makes sense. Like, so school for me wasn't interesting. Like school for me was interesting because it was anthropological. And that's why I feel like a lot of autistic people are, are anthropologists because we are stuck. We are the Dr. Spocks who are kind of half human, if you will. I know that probably sounds really dodgy. That's probably not the best analogy, but like we are the half human, half alien uh, creatures who kind of look like everybody else, but everybody else is really odd. <laughs> um, and I'm going to spend the rest of my life working these people out because they are just peculiar um and i think yeah i just think teenage years are hard for everybody and i'm I'm not like taking that away from autistic people at all whatsoever because being disabled and being neurodivergent and teenage is awful but i just think that teenage years are awful um especially if you're growing into a body that isn't particularly what you thought it was going to be and stuff like that like um but I think it was a choice to kind of, well, was it a choice to be into kind of punk music and a kind of fuck you attitude? I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, you know, but I wear my hippie clothes now and I've still got that attitude and I'm 31. So I'm assuming there's some kind of authenticness to that, authenticity to that. Um, I've really forgotten what your question was. <laughs> I don't think I've answered it. I, don't know. I, think you, I think you've answered it really well, actually, though. Because, sorry, Chloe, just to interrupt, I just wanted to to pick up on what you said there because it, it, it's so important where is that line between what's just human stuff and humans reacting in different situations <laughs> to different things and what is autistic stuff and i think mm. you know to draw a line there is really really difficult it's really hard to do that but i think when you bring it down to kind of not all humans are invalidated for very specific things that autistic people are invalidated for over the whole course of their lives i think that's when you start to kind of really dig into kind of what's just humans reacting to certain stresses and traumas and what's autistic people reacting to certain specific things that are only necessarily applied to certain groups i think that's different and it's the same similar kind of this is why um you know, Damien Milton talks about Goffman all the time. I think Goffman's brilliant and what a lot of Goffman mm. said. But William Du Bois really brought everything home to me um, in terms of being another sociologist when he was talking about black people being oppressed in kind of the late 19th, early 20th century. And he wrote about something he called the double consciousness, which was about black people who have to project being whiter versions of being black people more acceptable versions of being black people mm. and it became like a and it's really interesting uh what the person said before about systems um and about projecting different personalities in order to be acceptable around other people for other people to deem as being acceptable and then there comes a point where you do that for so long that actually that person there's like a schism happens in your head where that becomes a whole another personality that becomes a whole other part of you um which is directly related to you as an authentic person. and there's, But there's layers there. So it's just another version of you which appears when other people have certain expectations of you in certain environments. So it's just, it's such a complicated thing. But I think I recognize what Katie was saying there in terms of kind of, you know, what am I doing just as a human being? But what am also am I doing as an autistic human being? And is there a difference between those two things? And I think there's more pressures on marginalized groups, which is why mm. it may be more for marginalized groups than it is for your everyday kind of human that might not feel that marginalization or that othering in certain ways. Mm. Mm. And I think there's a certain there's a certain amount of privilege for me as well, because when I look um, for obvious reasons, but also like, um, you know, I think I spoke about it in, in the piece I wrote about autistic shielding, about the fact that, um, when I was in social situations outside of school, because I just went into school, did what I did, um, I was part of the drama club. So you can imagine how many neurodivergent people there were in there and queer people mm. there were in there. There were stacks. Um, and then when you, I think when when you realise that you're autistic and you look back at all the people you've had in your life or currently have in your life, you think, mm, yeah, I ain't the only one here. <laughs> um, and I think I definitely look back at my scout group and think, yeah, I'm not sure there was a neurotypical one among us. 
um, which is brilliant. And I loved scouts. So like lovely, you know, before I worked with kids, um, I was in a bakery. Like if you've ever worked as a baker, we are like the strangest people in the entire world. We crawl out of our beds at three o'clock in the morning to make unappreciative people bread <laughs> and cakes. <laughs> Like in, in a windowless, dusty room, right? Yeah, and, then, and it's all men in there as well, and then little old me. Um, <clears throat> and there's at least there was at least two learning disabled people who I worked with there. Um, there was a couple of queer people working in there as well. And like, is a like working in a bakery is strange. Like, it's it's nice work. I enjoyed it, but it it's like normies don't do that normal people don't do this job it's a very weird job like um in the same like way like dock work and stuff like that you have to be a certain kind of person to do that kind of job um which is my kind of people um and then i think you know working with the kids i work with now like it doesn't matter if the thing that i'm doing at wheelchair basketball is meowing like a cat whilst i go down one end to the other like it doesn't matter and if i turn up in the same clothing that i've been turning up for you know, and I wear the, and the kids take the piss out of me because I wear shorts all the time. I wear shorts all year round. If I could, if I didn't have runners at work, I would wear flip flops at work because that's I I don't wear trousers. Like, just no, I'm always too hot. And but I'm round children who are exactly the same. We'll be standing out there in January wherever we are at the country park, and none of us have got coats on we've all bought our coats with us because our mothers have made us but none of us have got them on um so i think i'm i've just been very strangely lucky in the fact that probably everyone in my family is neurodivergent and then outside of school like the pockets of people i found myself in just happened to be neurodivergent as well so i don't know that masking has ever necessarily had to apply to me and then like in the punk scene and stuff like that like we all strange in the punk scene. Like <laughs> that's that, that's why we're there, you know. Um, otherwise, we'd all be listening to Bloody Oasis or some shit. And I think there's something quite important there as well is that you're saying if you know less chance. I'm not saying you haven't experienced trauma because I, I imagine mm. most of us as autistic people have, but less chance for maybe some of those particular autistic traumas <laughs> of invalidation for literally just how you experience being in the world um because I'm thinking I wonder because sometimes I think to myself did I always mask and then I think to myself well I did get referred to as a chameleon a lot because I would always end up looking dressing like liking the same music or whatever it was of mm. whoever I was dating mm. um and things like this and I think about obviously there's a there's a different level of privilege because I'm a white person um but I did grow up in a very poor very poor town um outside of London and talking the way I do nobody knows where this accent comes from really some of my family kind of talk like this but I have an autistic accent meaning it doesn't fit anywhere um and so I I as a teenager out of self-preservation was dressing like so you if, if you've uh, soft might not have heard this word but the word chav i'm sure means something nope to kieran and and katie the word chav it refers to a town called chatham which is where i near where i lived um and the phrase chatham chav it refers it's it's derogatory um and it refers to somebody who wears a lot of gold um probably steals a lot is it like red neck in america is it similar to that i, I think guess it maybe no. Oh, hick, redneck. It's quite difficult because it's a very particular thing to yeah, be a tab. It, yeah, this what it's short to... for. It's like it's like someone who grew up on a council estate. I don't know what the equivalent of that would be in, in the US. Um, but it, 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 it it's yeah, it's someone who kind of wears a tracksuit and trainers and would go out stealing stuff and would drink a would drink a lot in public and particularly young people, it's kind of and but would mm. be poor and yeah, it's. A, I think it's a very specific to the UK kind of thing, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. But... And I was, I was drinking at fourteen, going to clubs at fifteen. I had an orange face because none of us knew how to put on makeup. Um, <laughs> lots of gold, all this kind of thing. I was never comfortable in my own skin ever mm. until very, very recently. 
Um, so I guess I do meet to some extent that idea, that typical idea of masking. But at other times I really didn't. And I was screaming, I need help, I'm different. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know where I'm going with that. I guess it's um, the, the point also I wanted to make is, like you said, that we have a level of privilege in some capacity as white people. Um, Katie, potentially, because you were lucky, like you say, to be around good neurodivergent people, even if you didn't know that they were necessarily neurodivergent. Um, whereas I, I, when I look back, it's actually very few people, particularly when I was at school, that I would say were probably neurodivergent and okay. friends and made me feel safe. Yeah. I wasn't safe the majority of my team. That, that's why that word's key there, I think, Chloe, because I think what Katie described was not not like a sheltered upbringing, but you, had, you seem to have a lot of safe people around you growing up and um, mm. safe groups necessarily people where you where you could be more authentic and you know and and obviously what you do now in terms of you know being around children that are like you um which is wonderful that you can you can be in that space and i think for that's why i think it's a very kind of fluid thing um much like, like identity you know we're all individual we will we'll have different facets that make us up who we are and and our experiences bleed into that and i think that's why safety is such an important narrative in this in mm. terms of mm -hmm. you know chloe you've described not being safe growing up and that was very much my experience and even being at home and surrounded by looking back now neurodivergent people when i was at home they were neurodivergent people that were unsafe because they were very much struggling themselves so mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so i was in a very very unsafe environment so so for me i could look back and think actually i was masking a lot of the time <laughs> But I would like to put a, like a little red flag up here as well and bring everybody's thoughts back to the fact that masking isn't just about us, that there is a whole other side to this narrative where people think that we are masking all the time and we're hiding and that we're and that mm. we're not. So I just wanna I just wanna make sure that we don't lose sight of that mm. point that the masking narrative is 50% people who don't know what they're looking for. Mm. It's not just 50% mm. people who are hiding away from everybody else. This is people who haven't been looking, and I'm very with the diagnostic criteria, I'm always careful when I describe it that it's not just about autistic white boys, it's about autistic mm. white boys who present in a particular mm. way. Um, you know, which excludes everybody else, not just not just people who are non-binary, not just people who are trans, not just people who identify as being women. It, it's everybody that doesn't fit that narrative, including men. So the, the, there's a mm -hmm. whole but yeah, I'm sorry, I've just gotten the but I just wanted to make sure that everybody didn't lose sight of the fact that we're not just talking about something that just happens to autistic people and nothing else is going on outside mm. of that bubble mm. as well. Mm. And I think, like, just because, and this is a very personal thing, but it probably, probably chime with some other people as well, just because I wasn't in positions um, where I felt like I needed to mask or there was code switching going on and stuff like that, doesn't mean that I wasn't vulnerable to the same stuff that Absolutely. happens to a lot of us. So, like, I don't think, like, a lack of masking means a lack of trauma. Like, mm -hmm. no. Yeah. And like I, said, I didn't want to say that none of us had ex experienced yeah. um, trauma. Um, but, like, so I think that, because yeah. if, like you were saying about being in a neurodivergent household who doesn't necessarily know that they're neurodivergent as well, like... When I look back, um, I mean, work was fine, but like, um, you know, um, an ex partner of mine was into kind of, I don't want to talk about it too much, but was into like gang related stuff. Um, and that put me in some difficult situations. Mm. Um, but I don't know if that's an autistic vulnerability a assigned female vulnerability I don't, it's it's very hard to say so i don't know if it would be considered autistic trauma or or if there even needs to be a definition or divide to what's yeah. autistic trauma and what is just trauma some and, and ex happens. yeah exactly and that's kieran you talk about this all the time is is particularly again i'm going to keep bringing it back to that we have a number of intersectionalities on the screen but we know we don't know what it's like to be a black autistic person for instance yeah, exactly. and so there's all of this intersectionality mm. so you know we have melissa simmons on um twice actually but one about adhd and then one about the racism 
in our own community, our own autistic mm. community. So mm -hmm. you will then also have the issue for somebody that intersectionality, um, a black, like you said before, a black man who is autistic will be masking or shielding, basically protecting themselves for a number of reasons. Mm. Um, and, and they might not even be able to be unmasked in autistic spaces if it's a predominantly white autistic space for instance um and that is why we have we have that conversation because it's it's a it's a problem you know racism exists in our community as well why yes. wouldn't it because yes. white people can be racist whether they're autistic or not um and you know and i think like when i was talking about being like seen as an aggressive kind of arrogant quite loud um woman at the time i suppose girl i think like you know if i was had a different ethnicity like it would have been taken much much worse than that yeah. um and the you know the implications of that is really horrifying um you know and if actually if I, if I was a different ethnicity i'd probably still be sit i well, i wouldn't be here because i wouldn't know that i was autistic like it just or just feel safe you know rachel cullen we had this conversation last week and rachel was saying even even with this platform it might still be the case that, you know, black people, people of colour aren't interested or feel safe to come on this platform. And that's something mm. we, as well as us on this screen, as but us as a community, mm. need to change. But also being conscious that they have their own spaces as well that I might mm. not be aware of because why should I? Because that's their space. That's their safe space. Mm. And mm. so that kind of thing. Um, I had a train thought and I've lost it. Anyone else got a thought before I... <laughs> it comes back feel free sure, i'll save i'll give you some time uh <laughs> when i think about masking too like yeah uh, the point kieran's point was important that the 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 complexity of masking and that everyone does it and to me why it's so discussed in terms of autism is because of perhaps the severe, the, like how often we do it compared to neurotypical people. Mm. And that's probably true. Like we were talking about um, double consciousness, mm. um, white voice, black person, that, those kinds of things. It's like, yeah, like the more oppressions that oppressed identities, minoritized identities we throw on, the more uh, masking we see. So in some ways, it, yeah, it's, it's also like in, a, in a, an oppressed identity experience and not just an autistic experience. But I do think that there is some special flavor. I don't know, some special sauce of how it's, it's, it's also a, a special experience, a unique experience. Mm. When we experience mm. it. Uh, mm. I don't and I don't know if like with, <sighs> I don't know, like with what Kieran was saying about, sorry, I'm not sighing I'm, at anyone in particular. That was just me because why not? Um, <laughs> um yeah, I think what Kieran was saying about, um, you know, um, perhaps having, I don't know if the word personality was used, but different, um, like with code switching and stuff. So you have, these are the people I work with and therefore I wear my work hat here and this is what I do at work and all of that. I, I call it hats. Like, so my home hat is different to my work hat or whatever. Um, and I, I And you were saying about how that's also authentic as well. So I, I don't know if, I don't know if masking or shielding or whatever else is actually, although it's born of oppression, misogyny, racism, ableism, all the other isms and phobias that are thrown all of our ways, um, I don't know that it's necessarily a negative thing. Like if this is part of self actualization and if the self only exists within groups of people and systems, whether the systems are worth being part of or not is another question. Like it's building uh, nuanced ideas of authentic authenticity. Maybe. Yeah. Yes. I think, yeah, completely. That is exactly at the heart of what it is. It's, it, it, it's, your identity dependent on who you're with how safe you are with those people and what you act like around those people in terms of protecting yourself and and that kind of um what Soph said you know earlier about buddhism about kind of you know the 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 effectively yourself is defined by the interactions you have with other mm -hmm. people um 
if your interactions are solely negative in some way, then you're going to have to modulate your behavior or, you know, you're going to have to um, self monitor more carefully mm. when you are around people who are unsafe. And I think if you are around a lot of unsafe people, a lot of the time, mm. then your self monitoring is going to look different from when you are around fewer unsafe people a lot mm. of the time. So it, it's, sort of, it, and again, it's a kind of that ebb and flow, isn't it? it it's, and then that difference between kind of what's just context switching, wearing your different hats, you know, like mm. I am different with my parents to how I am different with my friends to how I'm different with my colleagues, maybe, or there might be slight fluctuations in behavior. That's the normalized kind of human behavior mm. because that's what everybody does. But when you're doing that because your experience is that I cannot communicate in the way that I, I would want to communicate mm. or naturally communicate because people have punished me for that. Mm -hmm. or there's been a perception of punishment not even punishment just the perception mm -hmm. that you are going mm -hmm. to be punished the threat of it. then yeah yeah so then that that's when the kind of that's when those steps kind of come in that that's when you step beyond normalized human behavior and you're looking into marginalized human behavior mm -hmm. and that's quite helpful as well because it makes me think about i am not masking by being on here with you folks and deciding not to swear this is my I'm on a platform that I'd quite like young people maybe to be able to listen to. And so I make the conscious decision for myself. No, don't worry, Katie. It's not to, it's not to, <laughs> no, it's a personal I mean, look of panic on Katie's face. <laughs> it's a personal thing to me. And that's not about other people. Um, it's just, I make that decision. I make the decision not to sit here with, sometimes I have a small glass of wine, but I, but I don't think anyone's ever seen me on this platform sitting here with a small glass of wine so there's there's things we make a decision about but it's not because I feel unsafe to do those things mm. I could sit here and swear I probably wouldn't feel comfortable about it but it's not because I feel unsafe and I think that's really important because before I really understood about masking in any real detail but I would talk about my autistic autistic experience and actually before I even knew I was autistic when I've been through therapies and things like this I would describe how as a very small child I would sit on the bus turn around to the people on the bus and tell them about my life right which is not a thing that you're supposed to do apparently you know I'd be like four or five and I'd be like right well I don't hello I don't live with my grand uh, with my parents because they both experience psychosis uh, well it wasn't called that back then but that's me reframing it because that's how I would refer to it now um and I live with my grandparents and this da, 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 and, da, da, da. and I started to learn people are not nice people mm. are cruel and that's what got me interested in how do we reduce stigma but by the time I got to teenage years I stopped talking to people about anything mm. real because I had learnt I got bullied by adults by children and then you start to learn other things as well. Particularly, it was a shock to me when suddenly boys became interested in me. That was very shocking because nobody had explained this stuff. Everybody else seemed to get the manual. Nobody explained that that was going to happen. And then I started, when I look back, I wouldn't have recognised it then. But like I say, masking by dressing like all the other girls and being much more sexualised, all these kinds of things, because actually I realised if I didn't put portray myself in a particular way which sounds counterproductive you think you'd maybe want to hide a bit more so that you're not sexualized but actually that was kind of worse I, re I realized that mm. boys and men were dangerous and I'm not mm. going to go into details but you know so mm. there's lots of this and being very naive because we can be very naive some of us as autistic people and so all this kind of thing so I can really I can now really tell the difference between I'm putting on my professional Chloe hat to be here with these folks um, and the people in the comment section versus masking. And I, and I definitely feel I don't really hold that, that mask anymore as much, not that, that trauma based mask um, from learning all these things and just being exhausted. It's exhausting. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. That's what we haven't also talked about is the, that masking also it hurts us. <laughs> Sorry, I just read yeah, that. <laughs> so, sorry, <laughs> sorry for people who can't read the comment. It says, "Oh, Chloe Savell's all right, like a docker fighting a rat that has stolen her bags and whiskey." I've never smoked in my life. 
I don't like whiskey, but that's funny. And I haven't ever fought a dog. I've never fought a rat either, just to be clear. <laughs> that's good. Just clear that up. Just clarify that one. <laughs> I want to make note of the last comment, too, that was a question asking if we mask around friends or family. And to me, that's like, mm. if you can mask around anyone, if you can feel uncomfortable and unsafe in a situation and you need to mask consciously or unconsciously to get through that situation, if a family member or a friend does that to you, uh, makes you feel unsafe, then absolutely you mm. you can mask and you might mask. Uh, so that's super normal. Oh, and I want to throw in customer service voice too. Anyone in cus customer service? Um, and maybe this is helping me understand the difference. Like customer service voice like isn't masking until like there's, there's all this customer service understanding of when a, a Karen or someone who feels that they have a lot of privilege over you and they're angry, like when they yell at you and they make you feel unsafe and you have to continue that customer voice to get through the situation in an okay way. I feel like that might be, I'm trying to grapple with what masking really means. I feel like that those two examples might be, <laughs> send help, please. Is this <laughs> yeah, customer service. I, yeah, I was in I mean, customer service for a very long time yeah. and it's, well, it's, it's not fun. No, it's not. And if you imagine that kind of customer service voice your whole life, not all the time, not 100% of the time, but most mm. of the time, right back from childhood all the way through to however old you are now, then mm. in degrees, obviously. But, you know, as that's why, again, safety is such really kind of at the heart of this narrative in terms of as we grow older. And this is where, you know, we haven't even talked about shielding yet. <laughs> not Katie's on, on the definition of shielding. Um, but Katie's definition of shielding, the way that I interpreted was around having the ability to kind of wield safety and um, to have i've talked to you chloe about having my safe bubble before um and that as i understood more about myself and i recognized that there were people in my life who and situations in my life which were really problematic for me and drained an awful lot of energy for me and that i was unable to be myself with those people or i was unable to be myself in those situations as I've learned more about that and things have changed in my life through that knowledge, I've been able to remove myself from those situations or not go into them. I've been able to remove certain people from my life who were unsafe for me. So mm. that's allowed me to expand my bubble of safety and mm. having the privilege of being someone who's self-employed, I choose who I work with. You know, if I don't want to work with someone, I won't work with them. Or if I don't want to work with an organization, I won't work with them. Whereas when I was employed, I didn't have choice. I didn't have mm. any control mm. over my life because I had to be around certain people and otherwise I would lose my job and have no money. So it's kind of, mm. you know, it, it's, I think that's where my interpretation of what Katie's shielding is. But I think that's really what Sof was kind of saying there in terms of kind of that customer service voice until you've got control over the situation that you're in and situate over your life as well, to a grander extent, mm. you're going to have that customer service voice to an extent all the time. And that's, exhausting okay so i think my two points then that will connect all of this and then get us on to what exactly is shielding is why it was important to write the masking and stigma paper that you wrote with amy pearson because the important part was this idea the illusion of choice part and this all connects mm. to where people are saying in the comments section about how they mask with friends and family and things like this and even if it's a you know friends and family that you don't necessarily feel unsafe around per se i think it's important to get to this point of the illusion of choice so yeah. how we're being blamed mm -hmm. in the non-autistic autism literature yeah do you want to talk to that okay so um so yeah so it, it's kind of on multiple levels but the first level is that you know trying to figure out what's the difference between what you're doing unconsciously because that's developmentally your reaction to what's happened your life growing up and the situations that you've been in and the unsafe people you've been around so firstly there's you know you've got no choice over any of that because you've learned developmentally this is how you have to react in order to keep yourself safe um so that's your brain kind of just reacting from a trauma kind of response to stigma and and invalidation all those kind of things but then there's the secondary level of i mean that analogy around kind of like I recognize people are harmful in my family, but if I have to be in that situation to, with them, I have to suppress myself in certain ways. You could argue there's an element of choice there, but if you've got no choice being around those people, 
you've got no choice in how you behave either either so on a very superficial level yes there's choice there that you are choosing to suppress things that you might want to say to them you might suppress the way that you're acting around them and all of those kind of things but on a much deeper level because you have no choice but to be around those people you have to protect yourself in some way so the choice isn't really there at all that you have you're forced into that situation and you're forced to act in certain ways so the whole illusion of choice thing was basically fundamentally around all of that that from an academic perspective masking is around oh look there are people i'm going to talk to those people and be around those people let's put my mask on let's mm. go and act like them and then afterwards i can just take it off again and be authentically me again mm. but no that's not what's happening this is a lifelong wraparound trauma response that that's mm. yes there's superficially elements of choice within it but they're not really choice because yeah. you have no choice over them over those situations mm. you have to be like that and so that's really where that came from how many late discovered autistic people have we met and maybe some of us ourselves who don't feel like we know who we really are like yeah. we don't we feel like if i take my mask off i've learned about this thing called masking if i take my mask off there might be not any there might be nobody underneath and mm. that's really scary you know so mm. again it feeds it, that narrative within the non autistic autism literature this illusion that we, like I say, we put it on in social situations and then we take it off. We mask by ourselves and there's no one around. Yeah. You know, yeah. we make decisions based on that, again, unconscious. And in, in, internalised ableism plays a massive part of that as well, mm. especially what you just said there about masking by ourselves when we're at home. I mean, even now, as someone who's been like, I've been unpicking this for 20 years now. And I'm still not there and I'll never be there because, you know, this is you never unwrap all your trauma entirely. You just have to learn mm. to sit with it and carry it around with you and be comfortable with it as much as you can. Um, but there are times when I'm at home and I'll find I'll be in the middle of I'll be just completely unconsciously. I'll be stimming or I'll be doing something and I'll stop myself. I'll become aware of what I'm doing and I will stop myself and I will think, oh, imagine if someone saw me doing that. And that'll be the first thing that wraps through my head. So that ableism just, I mean, and this is someone who for the last 20 years has been unpicking this for the last 10 years has been furiously trying to figure out how, you know, to, to be comfortable with myself, to be comfortable around other people. I've got my safe bubble. I am surrounded by people who I adore and make me feel safe, but still that trauma just flashes up and it's still mm -hmm. there. And it, it's, so if that happens to me, then people who have not had the privilege of unpicking this for a very long time and of working through their trauma for a very long, long time are going to be attacked by this constantly, this internalised narrative of, of, of stopping yourself from being you because of the perception of what other people might think. And that's, again, it's not a choice. It's a reaction. It's, a tra it's just trauma. It's all trauma. And then why is that narrative the non-autistic narrative about us masking or what they would prefer to as camouflaging, why is that stigmatising? What is that doing? Kira? <laughs> <laughs> your paper! It's a great paper! <laughs> <laughs> What's it doing? Um, it's just reinforcing false narratives. Um, it's reinforcing the trauma. Uh, it's victim-blaming it's telling us that we are the problem and it's telling us that we are the problem in very binary ways which are set in old ways of thinking around gender race all of those kind of things and mm. um, and it what it's doing really is protecting professionals from the fact that they don't know what they're doing they absolutely do not know what they're doing they're not informed enough they're not trained well enough um, they haven't embedded themselves in the people that they're supposed to be supporting in, in that community. They don't know the narratives within that community. They are thriving and living on this 100-year history, which mm -hmm. is all based on observation and hasn't included autistic voices at all. And that's what it's doing. It's reinforcing all of those things. And basically, it's what I referred to earlier. You know, school's a great example of this. It's like, you know, they're fine in school. They're absolutely fine in school. We don't recognise that that's an autistic person. An autistic person could go singing and kicking and dancing across most classrooms and they wouldn't be recognised. Now, if they went and got a diagnosis, for argument's sake, or they were identified in some way, school response would be, well, they were masking, weren't they? 
we didn't see it because they were masking. No, you didn't see it because you're not informed well enough and you're not thinking hard enough. Mm. It's all victim blaming narratives. And there's an element of parental blame there as well and carer blame. Yeah. Like, well, we get on fine with him at school. Yeah, it's your problem. So it's obviously you're something the one you're the doing at home. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, I see that all the time. Work is absolutely horrendous, and trying to get people to um, schools to believe you to then get you know EHCPs, and it's just like a complete nightmare. When and and people have to get right to the end of like crisis mode. Yeah, you know, and you see it. You see it now in the kind of um, we were having a chat uh, today or yesterday, weren't we? The, the well, the Chloe and Katie and a few others about the kind of uh, neurodiversity light narrative and the neurodiversity and employment narrative. Um, I had someone the other day come and say, "Can you come and do a talk for my organisation? We want to talk. We want to learn more about masking, and we want some strategies that we can put in place in the workplace to support people not to mask." And I said, "No, I can't do that." I said, because if you want them not to mask at work, you need to make them not only safe at work, you need to make them unsafe and make, make them feel safe outside of work as well, because it carries over. You can't distinguish between the two. You don't suddenly walk into a building and pop your mask on and mask all day and then take it off again at the outside. Mm. This is a whole social problem, um, which is completely being ignored by it being focused on certain situations. Mm. Mm. And that brings back to one of my points I was going to make towards the end but um when people sometimes autistic people who might want a consultation with me and they're quite new to their discovery and they're working all this stuff out um but also sometimes non-autistic people in school settings and all sorts of settings will say so the autistic person how do I like help me unmask and the, the school setting how do we help them unmask I won't work with you to unmask the person because no. like you say Kieran that that mask is a survival mechanism and if you literally just throw that away there's there's nothing left to to they don't necessarily know who they are as an autistic person so what we keep talking about is i will say i will build with you knowledge about your autistic profile what's your sensory profile because they mm. probably don't really know yeah. i didn't really know mm. i only learned that i did that i thought so vividly in pictures and some people don't which still blows my mind since 2018 you know all these sorts of things i you help the person build their knowledge of their profile then you give them knowledge so this is all about self-advocacy now you know mm. you help them then build knowledge of their rights okay i'm not saying the rights always in terms of the law work in our favor but they do exist and then you help them communicate those needs and wants about around their autistic nature that's the only way you might help somebody and then we go back to kieran's point that you've said in other lives to control their mask or maybe this is now moving on to is that no longer a mask and it's now a shield yeah because they're conscious of it they're aware of it they know why it exists why it's there and they've got that knowledge of themselves so they can consciously potentially start to protect themselves in certain situations hmm. so, i don't i don't know how conscious i don't know how conscious shielding is either um yeah i'm not i'm not convinced of that either i just think we kind of plop along in life and 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 what happens happens really um you know like i was saying about being around quite a lot of neurodivergent people just happen to be in my life you know so it 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 was I don't know if easy is quite the right word, but it was easier for me than it would be for some other people, definitely, to authentically be myself. Or and and actually, like as a teenager and a young adult, and even now at thirty-one, like I don't know who I am. I'm never going to know who I am. I'm unraveling and learning stuff about myself and my experience and other people and my place in the world. And the world is always changing as well. Like. I'm never going to, none of us are hundred percent ever going to know who we are. Like, um, you know, I don't think it's like a stick of rock that you keep licking and keep licking and keep licking and, and you'll find the words in the middle. Like it just <laughs> it doesn't really work like that. Um, so it's such I, a I, random analogy. I'm like, what is that analogy? <laughs> but it makes sense, right? It does. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know if, if Soph even knows what a stick of rock is. Is that like a, a lolly? 
Huh? Yeah, kind of. Kind yeah, of, like kind of a hard yeah. candy. Oh yeah, and then yeah, they yeah. Have, like, we have those writing too. in the yeah. middle, and there's a word cut through the middle and the inside. Yeah. Okay, yeah, no, I we don't have. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a very know, English thing, I think. or something. I don't know. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so I don't. I don't think that. Yeah, consciousness is such a weird thing, anyways. And you can talk well, about guess, that forever and ever I, and ever. I guess the point is that eventually, what I hope for, what Kieran, like any of us that work with autistic people, hopes for, is that, like I say, we can help them build knowledge of their profile. Because then they know why they need certain mm. things, why they need mm. to do certain things, um, introduce them to certain things. That's why I'm always asking what people's favourite stims are, so I can see if there's one I can mm. steal that I haven't yeah. tried before and that works really well for me. Um, so helping them build that knowledge of their profile and then because they're in control of their mask. So like you said, Kieran, although yours is a slightly sort of sadder instance where you, you sometimes go oh, stop, stop stimming because what if somebody saw me? But you're still consciously aware yeah. of that process. And I, I am more consciously aware of that process now. Like I will pay much more attention. I've mentioned before on, on different lives, I pay much more attention now when I do this weird little toe tapping thing when I'm at the checkout because I'm getting really stressed and overwhelmed. But I become very conscious of it. And I'm like, right, Chloe, do not stop doing that because now you're conscious of it and you people will be seeing you. Don't stop because you know you need to do this. Again, I'm a white woman and can be privileged enough to be able to do that and, and actually still feel relatively safe other than maybe some people thinking I'm weird. Now I know that, that that's the worst that's potentially going to happen to me is people are going to think I'm weird. Okay. I think that comes with that. a kind of um, deeper level of self-awareness. And I think the more you kind of... The more Katie's right, you know, like no one's ever going to get to the, the the core of who they are as a person because that that's not possible, I don't think, because we're always learning about ourselves and entering new situations and how we respond and react and different things and all of that kind of stuff. But I think the more you, I think there's steps to what Katie's come up with, and I think it's really important what Katie's come up with. I think the the more you explore yourself in terms of what you said like the sensory stuff um maybe explore your communication reframing your trauma um throughout mm -hmm. your life and reframing your life which is what many of us do when we realize that we're autistic we kind of reflect back and and restart reframing different situations and start realizing there were reasons for things happening and stuff like that the more you do that the more autonomy you're going to have because the more you're going to start recognizing your own needs and and then the more autonomy you have the more agencies you're going to have because you're more informed about your choices and about what's going on in your life and mm -hmm. that level of awareness and then i think that then leads to that final step which is the ability to be more authentic so the more you understand yourself that you go through those that kind of process to being able to be more yourself because you might not be consciously aware of choices that you're making but there are some choices that you will consciously make like i could make the choice to spend time around more non-autistic people which then would make me more uncomfortable and make me more unsafe but i could also make the choice to actively seek out more autistic people and then that could help me to learn more about myself more about them, more about the intersectionality of both our experiences and, you know, which then teaches me about myself more and, and all of those kind of things. So I think there are active choices that we can make, but they only come from being informed. And if mm. we're not informed, then we can't make those choices. And I think there's, so there are, there is this constant level of unconscious decision-making, which is just mm. natural, but our unconscious is also driven by our knowledge and what we know and what we don't know and our perceptions around that, which again comes back to the, the Buddhist point that Soph made about kind of, you know, we're defined by our interactions with other people. So it's all connected like that. But the more knowledge we have about ourselves and about autistic experience, the more informed we are, the more able we're make, able to make proactive choices. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody's able to do that because some people are permanently unsafe. So there's mm -hmm. levels to it, which is wrapped around privilege. But certainly... I think that there are choices that we can make and the shield that Katie's talking about a lot of it. Yes. Is unconscious decision-making, but there are positive conscious choices that we can make mm. to make that a stronger shield. Mm. Yeah. And I think I do that. Like when you were talking about like autistic community and stuff, I think like, you know, having, having 
joined whatever the autistic community or or groups of autistic groups whatever um especially online for me over the last couple of years i think that is very much adding to my shield and mm. that's the knowledge and that's the understanding and appreciation of people who are around me um it's the validation i get from other autistic people it's like you know um the research that i've been doing with other non-binary and transgender autistic people and talking to them um like is massively validating for me and hopefully them as well and i think that's all part of the shield like community is part of the shield mm -hmm. and I, I don't think it's an individualized thing either necessarily like i would say that all academy is a shield if if i if i could say that like you know yeah, i know definitely. i can come here and i can say fucking bollocks and i can tell you what <laughs> i want to say and, you know, I don't think that anyone's going to have too much of an issue about that. And, you know, we are consensual here and we talk about, you know, if there's going to be something that you talk about and that it's going to be a trigger, like we do that for each other. And we're constantly aware of like, there might be people who can't hear this or can't see this or, and I think that's a massive part of shielding is definitely community uh, and you know family for those of us who have like a nice loving warm family whatever that looks like i'm not talking nuclear family i'm talking whatever chosen family definitely and queer platonic relationships most definitely and i think that's perhaps the difference between um definitely non-autistic ideas of masking and camouflaging and what i want to say about shielding is that shielding protects us and gives us our own communities and our own space to experience autistic joy and autistic pride you know we've got you know autism awareness month coming up hooray and like loads of us are sitting here thinking jesus this is going to be awful like batten down yeah. hatches that's why I'm, I'm is coming like people can get their posters can you put them anywhere in your gp surgery or anything there's downloadable digital ones on our page um little, little shameless plug but i got you know, sidetracked. I should have been doing other things. And I was like, no, I'm going to make this. And then I'm going to go around stuff. all the shops and I'm going to put that up. I like this. So I like this idea. So masking where potentially even now the non-autistic autism researchers are grabbing onto the term masking because they're like, oh, autistic community. We can we can be on side with them if we use their terminology, but they're still not getting it right. Um, and it does, like you say, sounds more individual as well. Like this idea that you've got a mask on top of a mask on top of a mask, potentially, like it keeps building. But I like this idea of a shield that you could just keep making the shield like bigger mm. and the shield could potentially, like you say, be spaces that we have as autistic people, like your pockets of community, whether it's academy or, or whatever little pockets that you have and having your shield of like, yeah, you non-autistic people are not allowed in here. You know, mm. academy is an open, this particular platform is open access. So non-autistic people <clears throat> can come and learn. Um, non-autistic neurotypical people, I should say, because any neurodivergent person is also welcome. Um, but we have our very closed, autistic only spaces, no neurotypical people allowed. Um, and those are very particular spaces as well to keep those people safe um, and mm. potentially shielded. And I wonder if shielding, particularly as a term anyway, might help with like Kieran's fight to highlight the protective properties, mm. not the social properties that keeps mm. getting peddled in the non-autism, mm. mm. non-autistic autism research. I think because every time, every time I talk to any neurodivergent people about this, and again, it's something I don't seem to have in common with anybody so far, is that, um, you know, when growing up, people always think, oh, I know I've just called myself weird as well, but like, I'm the weird one. I don't get it. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? And... <laughs> I, my thing was just like, what is wrong with all of you guys? Like, like, sorry, not you guys. I mean, like everyone at school. That was my, that was my big thing. Like, why on earth do you wear jeans? You all wear jeans. They are the most uncomfortable clothing in the entire world, and you are all wearing them. 
And I know that on non-school uniform day, you're all going to be wearing the same shit. And you all listen to the same naff music. You all talk about the same nonsense. It's all small talk. I'm not here for it. Tell me what you as an individual person are interested in. And I think that's why assimilation is interesting. And it always makes me think of the Borgs. Because, like, I think that's exactly what our society wants. It wants people to be processed through school and, you know, packaged up, labelled up, ready to work. Perfect. And you can work 40 hours a week and you guys probably not so by bottom the pile. And, you know, that's that's disabled and non-disabled, you know. And um, I can't remember what point I was making. It was probably going to be quite a good point as well. <laughs> I love how we um, do this. You know, I, I think a lot of people... Um, at centre, from my experience anyway, centre the kind of difficulties, struggles, differences, whatever, on what am I doing wrong? What what's what's wrong with me? And I've never really had that experience, um, really outside of kind of probably quite usual, typical teenage. <laughs> um, you know, like I. I and I, I don't think that's something that is shared by a lot of people. Am I wrong? I don't know. I think that's, and then that's interesting because I think about, I didn't necessarily think I was the broken one. Mm. I did, I was, I was hiding my, my, my thoughts, my, whatever it was, you know, my, my way of being in the world, but I still didn't think I was broken. I still looked around and thought, there is something wrong out here. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's a, a an interesting thing that some people will blame themselves mm. and internalise that. And some of us still were shielding or masking, but not necessarily blaming ourselves. I empathise mm. with kind of both those narratives. I mean, there, there were there were a lot of the time where I thought, hold on a minute, I can't be the only one that's wrong in all of this and the way that I'm looking at the world and thinking, why are you doing what you're doing and what on earth is the logic behind what's happening here? Mm. And so there was that element, but there was also the, and I think maybe during my teens more than anything and growing up and like being in my early twenties, that there was definitely that narrative of kind of, I would hit walls and would not know why I was hitting walls in certain things and would assume that that was because of me. Like, I couldn't make a telephone call and everybody else could just make telephone calls. Um, but I could make telephone calls to certain people who were safe people, looking back now. But at the time, it was like, I couldn't... like it. That I had a job at one point where I had to call people and I would literally spend all day building up to making one phone call, you know? And, and so in that kind of respect, I would kind of think, what's wrong with me? Why can't I just pick up the phone? Why can't I just do this? And that anxiety would then kick in. And, and so I think I had both those narratives going on at certain points in my life. And I think it very much depended around what the expectation of me was in those certain situations and, and as a kid, there are less expectations of you as well. You know, there are certain things you're expected to do. But as an adult, I think we have more responsibility. So therefore, there is more expectation put on us to be able to do certain things to match what you described, which is really kind of consumerism, packaging kids up, sending them through school and out into the world kind of thing. And, you know, so I think there's a kind of there's that kind of difference there. Mm. I think it's interesting what Victoria just put about um, I guess understanding boundaries and putting in, them yeah. in place are part of the shield. Absolutely. And I would say that's definitely definitely a thing. And I think that links back to what you were saying, Kieran, about, you know, as you get older and you come out of situations or you start dropping people out of your life that are unsafe yeah. people, then, like, yeah, that's definitely boundary setting, isn't it? Yeah, I think. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's a problem with adults bringing up children generally especially nowadays this, this the, the world that we live in at the moment that kids aren't encouraged to have boundaries with adults mm. and and i think autistic kids in particular are punished for trying to put boundaries in place um and that's certainly looking back that's my experience of growing up that every time i did try to put a boundary in space or challenge something or say no to something then i was shut down in multiple different ways mm -hmm. um by the adults around me. And I think, you know, as the school system now, 
school was hard enough when I was a kid. School was awful when I was a kid. I would not be able to survive in the school system now. And I think that's mm-hmm. because it's so behavioralist and it's so around Mm -hmm. conforming and not challenging teachers and adults and knowledge not asking questions all of those things that would that would kill me Mm. absolutely would kill me so i think um so yeah the having those boundaries and the ability to set those boundaries is absolutely vital to the shielding to taking that control and and having that kind of having that kind of safety bubble around us and we have cat for like comedic relief I (laughs) love Kat Um, and this is I guess this is everything I focus on at the moment like say particularly with young people and consultation is how that knowledge of themselves and then how do we put in boundaries which is why we're also going to be covering it with Eveline um, Welton next week Um, and how to train thought because what you just said was really key I watched this video and I've actually showed it to a a small number of consultees as well and, and particularly young consultees is it's this video that's it's one of those viral things. It's an American student and they are helping their friend with a piece of work, like on the laptop, whatever. And the teacher comes over and just stares them down and refuses to talk, but just stares them down. And But what's beautiful and what I would want to instill in every young person and an ad- an adult, particularly autistic young person adult, is that student turns around and says and explains what they're doing. I'm helping the, my friend. They were confused about how to do this thing. And the teacher still doesn't talk, just keeps staring them down. And the, the young person turns around and says, this is not helpful. I realise you're trying to intimidate me, but you need to talk to me. And all this kind of thing. And those tactics might not they might start to break down now because those tactics would have worked probably on some of us. Hmm. But I like that maybe we can start to support particularly autistic young people who have had our autonomy autonomy and boundaries crossed multiple times and invalidated is being able to confidently as much as possible be able to turn around and say, this behaviour you're doing is not appropriate. If you want to talk to me and tell me something, you can. But Hmm. this intimidation is inappropriate and Mm. things like that and having those scripts you know as autistic people lots of us as autistic people not all like our scripts we like to be prepared so that we're not having to process in real time Mm. and so that really it was just a video I really enjoyed because I just thought yes can we instill this and build their shield with boundaries and things um because like I say I like this point that maybe talking about shielding as well just highlights the protective properties it's protecting us it's not about you Mm. non-autistic researcher Mm -hmm. and that we're hiding like you say and that's completely stigmatizing it's blaming us particularly if we're assigned female at birth you sneaky autistic girl you've Mm. hidden your autism from us it's not our fault no we weren't hiding often as kieran has has talked about before sometimes annette has talked about as well going to multiple therapists and not one of them until they were 39 said oh it might be autistic or autism is the reason mm-hmm. that you keep coming and you're stressed and you're this and you're that mm-hmm. sometimes we're, we're we're screaming help and we're still getting missed so this idea of masking and it's 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 what we've seen haven't we we've seen the shift from look at all these observably white autistic boys who are a particular type of autism they're not because that's a horrible narrative as well. But there are, you know, look at all these autistic white boys. Now we're moving on to finding those sneaky autistic white women who are and girls who are hiding their autism from us. Mm-hmm. And neither of those narratives is helpful for anyone because it's again, it's missing so many people, you know, different genders, different ethnicities with that narrative. And we need to, yeah, get away from that idea. So I like this protective shield thing. Um, and I was mentioning before we came on that the postdoc Annette and I are on, we're going to be working with young people. We're particularly in this bigger project looking with, or working with young neurodivergent people, um, which is why we are on the project. And one of the workshops we're going to be doing with them, because the whole point of the workshops is to articulate or explore in a creative way. So you don't have to use mouth words, for instance, you can use all sorts of means of articulating if you've experienced trauma or what trauma might mean and what well-being and mental health might mean. 
So we're trying to give them some of that psychological distance. They don't necessarily have to talk about themselves. It could be like a creative method. But one of the workshops is around masking um, and building masks and having a you know, conversation around that. Um, but then we said, well, what, but, what, let's also talk about could we building shield, shields? Because it would be a different narrative that they might tell. If they're talking and building masks, that might t- tell a particular narrative about trauma and about mental health. If they're building and talking about shields, and shields could be all sorts of things, because I think, Katie, in your blog, you talk about um, like force fields, like shields, mm. like a um, spaceship might have. Um, me, I go full armor, shield, sword. I mean, there's a sword in my scenario. You know, there's all sorts of things. Um, you know, so that might tell a very different narrative from these for these young people if they decide mm. to build a shield. What does it look like? Why does it look that way? What does it do and what's its purpose? Yeah, and I don't think it's one or the other. And no. um yeah, and I yeah. And I think they are flexible and I think even masks are like a lifelong you know, creative work for us actually as well. Um so it's interesting that you're doing creative stuff um you know to to create those in the first place and then to maintain them and i think even that although although my shield for me um allows me to be me allows me to be very happy and very proud of who i am and all my intersectionalities it's taken 31 years to get there but like it's there um um Oh my goodness! What was the point I was going to say? Like, I it's it's a lifelong work. Like, so, and you know what you were saying about um, Kieran was saying about unsafe people, and you were saying about being exhausted um, by being around people all the time. Like, the shield is brilliant, but it doesn't mean that it works in all scenarios, Mm. and it doesn't mean that it isn't bloody hard work to carry on doing them. Um, You know, it's not a a, a nice, safe, and easy. conscious unconscious what however you know it's it's not um it's not easy it, it would be nicer if um all of, of i don't think it's just an autistic thing at all like it's definitely a marginalized thing like an intersectional thing completely um and you know but but it's not easy like you know the, the shielding isn't the easier way of masking <laughs> um so yeah it's it's it can be faulty and it can be a bit crap um and sometimes it works really well and sometimes it doesn't um you know and like having spoons like i feel like the spoon analogy or or theory is is really helpful for that as well and i think i i wrote that in my piece actually about shielding about you know the shield's only as good as as the amount of energy that you can put into it like so i've gone very big and so like my my shield is now like it's kind of rusty it's got holes in it and I'm holding instead of a sword it's like a giant spoon yeah yeah <laughs> I, yeah, I love it. It yeah, it's <laughs> something. yeah so so yeah so it's, it, it's still not easy it's still a difficult thing for marginalized people to have to constantly do that like would it be nicer and easier for me if I didn't have to do that like I have to create my own space and my own world and my own safe people in order for me to be me so it's it's still it it's not entirely devoid of masking um and like i say it takes energy yeah. to build that that shield oh, so yeah that, and loads of what, like, before i sorry go on. of being like really <laughs> every therapist i've ever i've ever spoken to said you're really um what's the word they use jay self-aware self-aware you're really self-aware yeah i know it's shit (laughs) i've been (laughs) self-aware since i was about four years old like i felt like i was born in like a a 50 year old 60 year old kind of brain like i've always been self-aware i'm aware of like the problems and issues in absolutely everything around me which is is quite sad really it's quite upsetting like knowledge is power but like knowledge is like oh god christ look at the crap around us like um so i i think you have to be self-aware in order to have to 
have some kind of shielding device, if you will, but the the self awareness makes you need it more. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's like cyclical. So the more aware you are of not just self aware as well, like aware of kind of oppressive systems and misogyny and you know all the other terrible things and like nuclear families and heteronormativity and all of this kind of stuff like the more self-aware you become the more aware you become of systems around you that actually the more you need to make safe spaces for yourself you know that's why drag went underground that's why you know every queer thing you can ever think of was always underground and in a lot of countries and a lot of places it still massively is because it's not safe to be queer um you know and even within like the queer community and i don't know what soph thinks about this but like there's also a lot of problems within those communities in the same way that there is in the autistic community like just because there is an autistic community doesn't mean we all belong or feel like we belong here, or we feel safe here, or, um, you know, we have friends here, or there's not cliques here, and problems, and issues with language, and stuff like that, like, I don't know what you feel about that with the, with the queer community, soft, with, like, transphobia, biphobia, stuff like that, like, it's still not safe spaces. Oh, 100%. Mm. Uh, I just was a panelist for this non-binary event, at a college and we were all non-binary in the panel and we were asked a really kind of important question about like where what it's like being uh relating to other queer people or being involved with queer people but they're not non-binary and or they're not trans and yeah i mean the the white cis gay man is seen as kind of the most privileged person in that community and when we have a lot of crap to talk about some of the way that what those people might act uh in in terms of (laughs) keeping us safe and then there's the stereotypes of queerness being you're having a lot of relationships with people you're staying out late at night you're drinking you're being very extroverted you're being very like the effeminate gay man voice kind of stereotype and like where where and then you're going to pride and where do the autistic people go the neurodivergent people go who have like sensory issues when it's pride or where do you go for the after party when you don't drink or like what if you are ace or you're simply not interested in a relationship or you're in a monogamous relationship so 100% like even in queer spaces there's 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 some there's a lot of work to be done as well i think that's indicative of every community isn't it to 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 an extent because it's that's the whole nature of community people see this all the time it really annoys me it's like people say the autistic community is this or the autistic community Mm. acts like that or i'm not a part of the autistic community well communities are made up of various different groups Mm. who all interact and interconnect and some of them don't get on with each other and some of them hold very different beliefs but that doesn't mean we don't all share the same fundamental connection which is being autistic and the same with other communities as well that each each group within that community will share relatable things but there might be things that they vastly disagree on and i think that's you can't be safe in a community completely you can only be safe in aspects of a community and particularly you can only be safe around people who you really relate to as well and um, mm-hmm. on lots of different ways and it, it's i think we need to be less here and more taking a bit of more of a step back and looking at things in terms of facets and this facet might not be right for me but this facet might be and that doesn't mean that we're not all connected in some way though or that we don't all share stuff as much as we disagree as well Mm. it's and how we interact and how we communicate with those different facets as well is is really important and kind Mm. of finding some common ground in some way which isn't always achievable Mm. and i think because i had a point earlier on and i lost it because that's I'm, I'm like Katie. My brain just goes. I'm going to lose it again. Wait. Um. So I was the, no quick. Not you, say my, quick. Um, <laughs> right. It was that. Yes. Building our shields about it being exhausting, and but part of that is yeah. Where are we putting our spoons? Because we're either putting our mm-hmm. spoons into being an individual who masks and potentially being mm-hmm. a person with autism in quotation marks, or we're using our spoons to build our shield which means about like potentially building autistic community which you're you're isolated in one instance and still wasting a lot of energy and spoons and potentially more likely to 
um, trigger warning, I'm only mentioning it, but suicide. So we're more likely to, you know, die by suicide. I'm not saying that that's not the case if we're not connected within the community, but I wonder to what extent, obviously, less masking, feeling you connect with other individuals, has social cure properties, which I've written about before. Um, I've got a piece that I've written that's called healing from the culture of autism in words and pictures and I can't figure out where to publish it because it's a very random thing because it's got bits from Annette's performance where we write about and you know how you heal from the culture of autism by becoming part of the autistic culture and building like I say this idea of the shield which is is really nice and I had a there was a whole point to this come on Chloe you can do it it's exhausting protective spoons, where you put your spoons where you put your spoons just yeah where, where are you going to put your spoons being and, more and productive in for you, you yeah energy, yeah for you um because you'll get those protective well-being properties i think if you find it doesn't have to be a huge community it could literally be like three people three autistic people who you just happen to connect mm -hmm. with um and that is your shield because it's still stopping everybody else coming in or you going out into the world where you don't want to be necessarily um mm. i think there was another point but i've lost it and i feel like soft had a point Sof. well i have like a question which is for the well-intentioned company or school or family that wants to learn like how to be like they, they want their their person to feel comfortable not masking but that's difficult because are they safe outside of that space too uh, which is true for a lot of minoritized identities. Like we talk about retention of a certain minoritized group. Are they safe in that city outside? Are they safe on the bus? Are they comfortable? Um, but what's the, what's the hope or the goal that these groups can strive for? Or what's like realistic? Like we don't want to assimilate to the group. We don't want to feel like we have to watch over our, our actions in such a way that we can't be who we are what what's the what's the hope like because there will be danger in some spaces but couldn't places be more safer safe in general couldn't we couldn't there be a i don't know i'm thinking of like a utopia or something yeah we do talk about utopia quite a lot um mm -hmm. in in a lot of our closed spaces and on here um and then it ends up because we did a session about um how neurodivergent people might be more prone to getting sucked into cults and then i'm like i don't want us to sound like a cult because we keep talking about utopia mm -hmm. uh, but people can leave that's the difference apparently that i you know the people would have the um, no obligation yeah but in terms of the like goal per se I, I guess I never think of it quite like that. But what we had noted and discussed, like Annette and I, when we did our um, uh, pre and or post sort of diagnosis, but it's really a discovery program with university students, is that if they only came to our spaces for like two hours a week where they were accepted and nobody thought anything of, or even we just celebrated the things that they felt safe in that space to do which took a lot of time because they needed to build that trust and things like that even just that two hours a week meant that they could relax a bit be themselves and it had some protective properties obviously ideally you'd want that everywhere but i think that's better than nothing in terms of potentially building mm. somebody's mm. psychological well-being mm. Kira? I oh, think sorry, it, I just felt like Kieran had a point. No, no, no. I, I think think you're right. And I think on a deeper level, the goal for me is people having informed choice about, you know, some control over, you know, I want to go to close program because that gives me two hours of respite from a world which isn't very nice to me. Um, so I've got choice over whether I choose to go to close program or not. Whereas at the moment, I don't have choice the rest of the time so giving people choice about where they initiate you know the katie's conceptualization of this where they spend those spoons having that you know is this productive for me i have a choice in choosing what's productive for me and what mm. isn't 
and so many people at the moment don't have that choice. It's it's what Katie described, you know, happening to fall into certain safe situations mm -hmm. rather than proactively thinking, I'm going to enter a safe situation mm -hmm. because there is one for me ready made, or I'm going to, or I, or I have the spoons and the capacity to make a safe situation for mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. So it's about that control and choice. It, it's autonomy. Everything comes back to autonomy, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, we talk about, are, are people autistic? Are they PDA? And we have all these, things, but really it comes back to autonomy. And the more autonomy people have to make safe, informed choices about mm. their life and their situations and their futures, then the happier people will be. And at the moment, we don't have that. We don't have those choices and we have to kind of carve them out where we can get minuscule little parts of them. And like you say, so many people might not have the energy, the means, the resources, whatever it might be, to build those spaces. I have built some of those spaces. Kieran has built some of those spaces. Uh, Katie and Sof potentially have built some of those spaces. Um, you know, before I even knew I was autistic, I realised I didn't fit in, et cetera, et cetera. And so when I was at university, there was no groups that I wanted to be part of. There was no socials that I be wanted to be part of. So I made a non-drinking um, it was called Students for Students, but it was literally if you felt you had a mental health concern, you could come to that space and it wasn't around drinking and things like that. So I made my little neurodivergent bubble because it didn't mm. exist. But mm. not everybody has those spoons or resources. Mm. Um, and they and rely I'm very on conscious. those of us that are privileged enough to be able to make those spaces. Yeah. Which, like, not to sound ungrateful or anything like that, but, like, it's exhausting for us. <laughs> like why do why it's lovely that autistic communities exist and autistic spaces exist but why the fuck have we got to be putting in all this work like all the time why is it always on disabled people to save other disabled people like i love the fact that we are here and i love the fact that we can um raise up the voices of autistic people of all sorts of different intersectionalities but by christ why are we the only people doing it like for and for me, like, I think a lot of us talk about school and talk about teenage years and stuff, and a lot of us really didn't get on with school. And I th I, I, think it's wider than just how do you just support neurodivergent people, but how everyone gets supported. Yeah, because yeah. you see this word flung around all the time, and it's so annoying, student-led or child-focused, or and I have never, ever seen an EHCP anything like that that was actually individualized to the chart i've never seen it and in, in all the hundreds i've seen i've just never seen it because they are not actually interested in um and i don't mean like teachers necessarily but i mean the system in general system. in in actually helping children and young people like they're, they're not interested in that from any marginalized group and if you're intersectional then ugh, like good luck um so I, I don't think it's necessarily about just supporting neurodivergent people like um i i talked to this with my husband quite a lot jay because he was um a teacher for 13 years um and he was talking about the fact that you know actually something that helps one kid in the class who's dyslexic learning disabled down syndrome whatever actually it's probably going to be a good choice for quite a lot of the kids in there and like why aren't kids and young people given options why aren't you know even as me as a mature student why aren't i given options for things like you know why aren't any of us given options that actually makes I mean, and this is just education but it could be healthcare, family whatever why aren't we given more choice and more informed information um and just like different way of doing things. It's like you fit in this box or like you don't and good luck, you know? And I just, I, I think if we got out of that mentality of one size fits all when actually one size fits fucking nobody, like I think that would be, I mean, but that is um, total idealistic dream world <laughs> stuff, you know? Chloe, do you remember um, the first time I came on Academy and we had a conversation about how the diagnostic criteria is reflective of society in terms of it has very rigid behaviours, it's very inflexible, it's repetitive. Everything about the diagnostic criteria is just a projection on how society acts and how systems have been created to make sure everybody does things in routines and in the same way and in the same you know, and we we are performative about difference. Mm. 
the whole of society is performative about difference. Difference is celebrated as long as it's extreme and as long as it's, it's over there and away from me. It's wonderful that people are different as long as they don't impact on me. And as long as they stay right over there and don't come, and that's, that's a reflection on society. And society calls itself inclusive. But yet it says that people have to change. Well, back to autistic people, we have to change in order to be a part of society. So that's not inclusion. But that's the idea of inclusion that's in schools. That's the well, idea of inclusion in the workplace, that you have to fit in in order to be accepted. They need to change and use the real word, which is assimilation. Yeah. They don't want inclusion. They're not trying to foster inclusion. They're trying to make the different, the disabled, assimilate. Yeah. Um, are you the right kind of autistic person? And then we'll <laughs> Yes, <laughs> off. Yes. Yes. Well, I saw this DEI post this morning on Instagram, and I wish I remembered the person uh, who posted. But they were posting about how white people are co-opting DEI initiatives. Oh, is that a thing that y'all know? DEI is that an acronym that? Yes, it's diversity, oh, equity, and inclusion. All right. Yeah, we have yeah. similar. Yeah. Cool. Perfect. I just realized that's probably a different acronym over there. <laughs> um, but it was the idea of like, oh, now like BIPOC people are in the car that's being driven there in the passenger seat and they can like maybe say something and do a request, but it's still like the white person driving the car who can say no, like, thanks for the request, not right now. And they're, they don't have that agency. And I'm throwing that in. <laughs> I don't know if I have a point about this beyond just to say like, we, we need to be driving, but it's also confusing because if um, autistic people, disabled people, BIPOC people are creating our spaces for ourselves and we also have limited spoons, limited energy, like that's also an issue. So maybe everyone should pay oppressed people money. <laughs> Reparations. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Katie, you're actually quite right because I'm exhausted. Um, and I think I said this maybe last week as well, but, um, you know, Sai and I did something, we, we went to the theatre. I don't leave my house, but there was something very Ooh. interesting. It was um, it was a, a, an all black cast or, or the main characters were all black character um, cast for The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and it was epic. Um, but it was this whole thing. It, it meant taking a lot of time, building up to going, making sure you took the right thing so that you could manage being in that space, all this kind of thing. And then the next day I had a meeting at like 10 a.m. Um, and Sai, after I finished the meeting, was just like, how are you not tired? I went, I don't understand how people can't see it. I am constantly exhausted. I can't even describe what my brain is doing. It's so... I, it's, I've said I, I think I've been in protracted burnout for about three years, but it's in functioning burnout. Oh, we've lost. <laughs> oh, okay. So, right, Kieran's just had to go for a family emergency. Hopefully, he's okay. We'll check in with him later. Um, but yeah, I think I've been in like functioning in quotation marks protracted burnout for the last three years. My brain is like fog. I, I don't know if I'm just making permanent damage to my brain mm. because it's really hard for us once we start advocating and doing the work that we do in all these different spaces. Mm -hmm. to, I, I, I can't give it up. I can't stop. Mm. Um, and if I could just do this stuff, that would be fine. But I have to do other stuff to pay the rent mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and and so so this isn't about the people particularly not directed at the autistic and disabled people in our comment section this is a this is a we shouldn't have to be doing this much work particularly mm -hmm. unpaid work mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. society shouldn't mm -hmm. create shouldn't have created this issue in the first place yeah. for us yeah. that we need to be doing this work yeah. and a lot of it being unpaid um yeah. so let's say that is not about our lovely autistic disabled people no oh, here. no 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 i'm this sorry about how much society exhausts us not, no no i know you didn't what no, i was no, at, at all no, um no. and you know and like with our autism awareness month coming up like loads of us i dare say the three of us talking now and very probably kieran as well as and loads of other people we know will be asked to, oh, can you come into the school and can you come into our group and can you talk about blah, blah, blah? Okay, how much am I getting paid for that? Oh, no, we're not getting paid for that. 
oh, right, okay, so you want to inspire your disabled young people that you work with by getting a disabled person in, okay, I'm here for it, but you're not going to pay that disabled person. Hmm. For, their, for, for not just knowledge, but emotional labour. Hmm. Yeah, like, like you're getting two, you're getting well, you're getting more than two things, but you're getting two things. If you brought in a non disabled person, you're getting some second hand knowledge. Yeah, if you're bringing real. in the disabled person, you're getting first hand knowledge and potentially bringing in community knowledge as well if they're part of the community that they're part of. Um, but you're also getting their emotional labor, mm. and, like, and that, that's, that's what twice, it is, yeah, yeah, like pay me more, like come on. And I think, like, with Spectrum 10K, like, with the whole Stop Spectrum 10K, which is still going on, I, I'm talking yeah. about it in past tense, but, like, it's still very much going on. Like, as the creator of that hashtag and then involved with quite a lot of the boycott Spectrum stuff as well, like, um, I, I think you were probably in the chat, Chloe. Like, when I left that chat group, I was just like, geez, I am just, like, at my wit's end with yeah. this like like i'm really pleased with what we've achieved so far it's definitely not me tapping out from this but at the moment and, but like, that's what really, also like, coming back again to a relatively positive point but what was important about that though is there were a number of us as advocates uh all all different backgrounds um so not, certainly not all you know like academics and what have you mm. and it was really important because people were saying i'm done i'm exhausted i've got nothing left that's fine next person's coming in to tap in and that's what's again coming back to this idea then of shielding as like yeah we're building those connections with people who get it mm. like I will I'll send you know I've seen this message I'll reply when I have the spoons leaving you one on red or something really brief actually mm -hmm. much briefer than that and the other person because they understand because they're autistic mm -hmm. would be like mm -hmm. no worries or even preemptively don't have to reply if you don't have the spoons mm -hmm. um and we had this when um, Sophie and I did something together a couple of months back, and I think we tried to organise it about four or five times, maybe. <laughs> and then there was something going on with you, and then there was something going on with me, and then there was something going on with my baby, and then there was something going on with you again. And I was yeah. just like, I'm really sorry for all this. And you were just like, look, you know, we're like neurodivergent people. Life. Like this is this is how we do. Like. Just you know, and, and, you know, poor old David Gray Hammond, we have been trying to organise since before Christmas to sit down and write like a four or five, like just even getting the first one done um, for about like a neuroqueer series, which is what we want to write about. Um, yeah, that's been, we've been trying to do that since November, but like we're disabled, we have mental health issues, like uh, we've both got children. I made, the like... I made the mistake of, <laughs> so I have to take caffeine tablets in the morning, so I don't drink tea, I don't drink coffee, and I will not be able to do literally anything if I don't have some form of caffeine in mm. my system. Um, and I'll come back to that question in a second. Um, oh no, don't get sidetracked. And I made the mistake of I had my caffeine and then my brain gets all excited about stuff and I have that energy for about an hour. <laughs> and I made the mistake of then, right, oh, quick, we keep talking about this, but we need to now do the Academy Queer Conference, blah, blah, blah. And I made this group and invited all these people and now I've got no spoons left. So I'm going to have to come back to it <laughs> when I have that momentum again. Um and things, so it's things like that. It's it's really hard because you have to go with the spoons. Mm -hmm. Like you, that's how we've gone off a completely different topics now. Like you have to work with the spoons. That might be a whole talk in itself. Mm. Go with the spoons. Um, and Sai's so just saying here, Academy will um, be will be uh, a community interest company or community interest group. That's what that means, soft. So um, I know it's slightly different in the states. So. It's not the same as a charity because actually that's a bit of a headache. Um, it's so it's a community interest company. So you could, but you can still ask or bid for funding and things like that. But the reason I haven't done it, I got no spoons, and it's been talked about for months and months. Um, but I keep saying, once I claw back a day in the yeah, week, I think it's been longer than a year actually. It's been longer than a year. Sorry, sorry, yeah, it's only been a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, it has. It's been like a, it's a couple of months. It's fine. To be honest, I think, yeah, Spectrum 10K, I think that did it for me. I think that well, was like, I say that, I'm still going, yeah, but I'm running on fumes. Yeah. 
and I'm I think get I think I think you're oh you get a clean up my goodness I, I have to after, I can't I, yeah after we had the baby my it's the it's probably the best thing I've ever done in my entire life and I realize how privileged I am sitting here going yes I pay someone to clean my house but l- literally if you can do it people like I cannot recommend enough I like, think I'm gonna have to I just can't oh. I've realized I, I, yeah like I said the last three years I'm much more disabled than I, I've ever mm-hmm. been I think but mm-hmm. also interestingly uh, still also one of the most happy to some extent because of mm. it's it's we're, we're complicated human mm-hmm. beings right it is quarter past nine because this is what happens particularly if we get Kieran Rose on because we just keep going but it's been amazing and interesting um were there any key things you were hoping you were going to get to say about your ideas around shielding oh do you have notes? Notes. You have notes. <laughs> darling I've always got notes. You are beautiful I love it no, I just wanted to talk about toxic neurotypicality, which I think we covered. Yeah, and just about autistic joy and pride, like so much of our mm-hmm. existence, even with our, within our own spaces because of the things we do struggle with, like a lot of us struggle with, um, and life just being difficult for everyone. Like, I think we spend a lot of our time talking about stuff that is hard, that is difficult, and... It, even in autistic spaces, like non-autistic people obviously think we're like all disordered anyways, and you know, but um, so like for me, shielding is about protecting yourself to create autistic joy and autistic pride. Like that's that's the biggest thing for me. I want to take it away from us trying to fit in with neurotypical people and stuff like that, because uh, quite frankly, I don't think any of us are really particularly interested in that apart from like, you know, we have to work with these people and like various other things like that. Like for me, it's about creating community and creating family and creating, like you were saying with Spectrum 10K about the fact that, my God, I cannot do this today. And someone says, yeah, don't worry about it. I got it. Or like take a few days, don't worry about it. Like, um, and that is, that is really massive for us. So that that's that's the biggest thing. Like I didn't necessarily start this tonight thinking that shielding was community building, but I'm definitely coming round to that way of thinking about it now. I'm probably gonna write a piece on it. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to it. Um and Sai, just being Sai, NTs eat through their ears, apparently. Thank you for that, Sai. Very helpful. Um, I've just made a note. Anybody of any background who is neurodivergent in our comment section or anyone you can think of that might be really key let's do a session on autistic joy yes yes let's do a session let's that that'll be our um pushback against the awareness month um autistic pride autistic just autistic month would be nice um mm. but autistic joy anyone interested let's just have a little I say party, it's an autistic party and it's on this platform. So it's like not a party party. But yeah, an autistic joy. Because yeah. Katie, you were part of the Autistic Pride video last year, weren't you? Were you not? Did you not put something together for us? No? Uh, okay, don't mind me. Would it have been something I would have had to have made myself on a technological device? <laughs> Think about what you're okay. asking here, Chloe. Think about what you're asking. Okay. <laughs> Maybe not them. That's really um, <laughs> but yeah, if you're interested, autistic joy. Um, we'll we'll make a post. So I can you make a, just a note, just so that we remember to make a post on another day, because um, I will forget. Um, oh yeah, and Sai is making. Um, I love someone with neurotypicalism post and like a, <laughs> um, yes. a number of things. Neurotypical spectrum disorder. Can we make it that? I'm sure he's got something oh, like that in the work. That. Yes, please, he's please, really please. In Canva please. and things. If you're all still here, we're just rambling, by the way. So <laughs> thanks for still listening to us. Um, it's just but, Bobby but and Simon just, in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> Autistic Joy. We'll make a post. If you would like to come on this platform, you don't have to use your camera. You don't have to use your mic. You could just use the private chat. Um, and let's talk about Autistic Joy. What is it? What does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it feel like? Mm-hmm. All those kinds of things. What does it taste like? Um, what does it taste like exactly? What does autistic joy taste like? That can get really bizarre. I can see that will get really bizarre, particularly if size here. Um, yes. So I'm going to hand over to Soph actually for our final question. Mm-hmm. My my question for you is: What 
is your favorite stim? Ooh. Um, well, we were talking about this earlier before we came on here. Like, it's not necessarily my favorite thing, but it's a new thing today. So, like, I have this little squishy penguin who's a bit beaten up now, bless him. Um, but he's squishy and he's elasticated, which is nice, of course, as we know. But he's also a little bit sticky. So I like to just have a little bit of a gender euphoria moment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and have a little... Uh, I was just stuck that on my chin there to have a penguin soul patch. So I just right. stick into various bits of my face because why would you not do that? I'm gonna, once once baby is a little bit happier because he's not very well at the moment, bless him, I shall probably start sticking it to him as well. And see what, I, see think, what he thinks I had lots of those. And when you warm them up, that's when they're the best in terms oh. of their stick. And I would just sit watching telly and keep slapping them onto Louis's bald head so he would be there with like you know six foot three bearded guy with completely bald head though but just sticking all these little animals and he's just sitting oh. there and they're just like jelly and I'm just like oh, oh I so love nice. it yes mm. I have a new thing that um Victoria introduced me to now mm. you know the new like poppet things which I think Sof you had one didn't you yes when you came on so I've got this snail one but this is kind of like that but it's in a ball and it's very satisfying mm. when you do number of them I want it. and then pop them back. But I got two and they came in the post today. I've mm. already destroyed one. No. no. I've, it's deflated already. I've already destroyed it. It's still poppy though, which is nice. But yeah, so these are nice. I don't know where I, um, I think I just got it on Amazon. But yeah, I went I went and bought a load of things because I was like, do you know what? My stim suitcase is looking really sad for itself because you have to chuck some out once they've been destroyed by mm -hmm, young mm -hmm. people. And actually adults, when we get the adults who are like, mm -hmm. you know, head teachers, it's very fun to watch a male white head teacher in a grey suit sitting on the floor stimming. It's very exciting. Um, but yes, yeah, so I was like, oh, let's go on a stim, stim shop. And I bought loads of things, which is very exciting. What is it called? Okay, let me see what I actually bought. And Sof, have you got any new stims at the moment? No, I, um, I'm looking around my room. I do not. And in fact, I would like to get that one you showed. So that will be my new <laughs> stim. <laughs> we need to start getting commissions for all these for all these bloody stim toys we keep talking about and saying is really okay. good. Because the net always I mean, this... does it as well, don't they? <laughs> Oh, so I can I ask a question? Yeah. yeah. Your um, your body thing that you've got on at the moment, is that sensory? Oh, I didn't think about that. Um, okay, so it's an Ehlers-Danlos. Well, it's not quite. It's for anyone with connective tissue disorder. Okay. I, I'm, I suspect it could work for more people, even than just people with EDS or people with connective tissue disorders. But I'll go show you. We'll is it keeping you together so you don't yeah, sub Yeah, together. Here it is around okay. my legs and my knees. And then I've got it here. And then I've also got it on my back. But it, it is a lot of nice pressure. Yeah. Okay. I suspect it would help with someone's proprioception. Uh, or, um, okay. Fancy word. They're like their understanding of their body and space. So for yeah. all I know, like it could be worth Ooh. autistic person without any like pain and conditions to, to try. Okay. Ooh. Okay. That's just me being nosy. Cool. <laughs> Okay, lovely. So thank you, everybody, so much for being here. Um, we went on a really long run this time. Um, okay, so hold on a second. So next week, we should be having Evelyn Welton. I think I'm saying the name right. Um, and they are going to be talking about autistic boundary building. And they have a book for young people. I don't think it's just for autistic people per se, but obviously we need it because we're, we need to be able to build our boundaries. And so, yes, we're going to be discussing how do we do that with Eveline? Um, and then Sai wants to ask the final, final question. I knew you were going to throw us because he's like, no, you've made a demand now. Um, it's usually salad cream versus mayonnaise, but it's now listen to Nickelback or bungee into a volcano. <laughs> what earth did Nickelback sing? I can't remember. How you Wasn't remind it? me. Um, how you remind me. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't mind a bit of Nickelback. Yeah, that'd be fine. I don't like yes. a bungee jump. Like, High five. Volcano yeah. it is, apparently. 
Okay, no, it is. Yeah, <laughs> see you later then, Sai. <laughs> That's because I, Sai was, we were listening to my, um, uh, like my liked music on Spotify and it's very eclectic. It's very, very random, mostly because it's just a bunch of stimmy things that I've liked. Um, but Nickelback come up, came up and he wasn't impressed. Well, that's all right. That's <laughs> what about I, you, it's like Memories <laughs> as well, isn't it? Yes, it is. Soft, what about you? Volcano or Nickelback? Oh my gosh, Nickelback. I mean, like, I can handle if that's uncomfortable for me. <laughs> what All I can think of is, like, look at this photograph. Is that Nickelback? <laughs> Yep, that's like a yeah. yeah. I can handle that. I'll laugh at the the memes that come in my mind when I think about that. So I'll be <laughs> I think this is the problem. Nickelback has become like a meme, and that's really sad for me because we do like <laughs> them, but it's fine. It's fine. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm not gonna yuck anyone's yum. Like no, it's fine. there are people who like it, and that's great. <laughs> I like this. I'm gonna yuck anybody's yum. I like that. I'm just like this is autistic joy right now, isn't it? So this is why I'm stuck here. And so I'm going to say goodbye to everyone. You two feel free if you want to just quickly stay on just to say bye. Watch Nickelback bungee into a live volcano. <laughs> okay. There you go, Sai. Does that, does that meet your requirements? <laughs> That's harsh, man. Is it Chad Kroger? Was that his name? Yeah, he's crying somewhere. <laughs> Ryan. I don't know if he is. He's got a lot of money. He's he won't be <laughs> Yeah, and he's plainly not watching this, so like it's fine. Oh yeah, sad, sad times. Everyone should watch us rambling about autistic things. Anyway, bye bye everyone. Bye. bye.